just start. It's good advice. Kind of. While it's well-meaning, and while it is true that making games is usually the fastest way to learn how to make games, just start isn't always helpful advice. How do you just start? Should you just make something? Anything? Is it a good idea to dive into one of your many game ideas and work it out as you go? What if you don't have any ideas? Then what? While there are lots of ways to just start, by following tutorials or taking part in game jams, or if you're anything like me, by just messing around in game editors for the fun of it, if you're serious about making a game that you can finish, the best place for you to start from might actually be a lot more specific than you think. In this video, I'm going to give you some practical advice for starting your first game. How to choose an idea, how to decide how big your first project should be, and how you can organise your tasks and your time so that you can actually start making some real progress on it. So, first things first, what should you make? Chances are you already have an idea of what you want your game to be, or maybe you have several ideas and you're trying to choose just one of them. But even if you don't know what to make, the process of choosing a good idea for you is broadly the same. Play to your strengths, limit your weaknesses. After all, making a game can be hard, and if you want to actually finish it, you're going to need to stack the deck in your favour. And that means choosing an idea that you, and I mean specifically you, will find easier to see through to the end. So how do you do that? Everyone has a unique mix of experiences, skills and resources from their work, from their hobbies and from their past experiences that make up who they are and what they're capable of doing. This means that you have a set of skills that are unlike anyone else's, giving you an unfair advantage in specific areas. Some of these skills might be directly useful to game development, but others won't be, at least not on the surface. There are many broad skills, such as being creative, being technically minded or knowing how to manage a project, that can be applied to game development. Even unrelated knowledge, such as other hobbies or a particular field of work, can be useful experiences to draw on when choosing a game idea. Even if it's an activity that doesn't seem like it could be a game, you'll be much more likely to create something enjoyable and engaging if you already understand what is enjoyable about it, not to mention unique, meaning that embracing what's specific about you instead of trying to emulate what others have done may mean that your game is more successful. So how can you work out what your strengths are? If you're struggling to work this out for yourself, one approach is to make three lists. What am I good at? What do I like doing? What are my advantages? Under the first list, write out anything you're good at. It doesn't matter if it's related to game development or not. If you've got a skill or experience or a weird party trick, write it down here. Next, write down your hobbies and your interests, generally any way you like to spend your free time. This list can include things that you would enjoy even if it's not something you know how to do now. Finally, write down your advantages. This is anything that's beneficial, such as having a lot of free time, disposable income, the support of friends or family, or just being young. Once you've listed your strengths, make a new list of everything that you think will be involved in making a particular game idea, ideally in order of importance. So for example, a simulation game would require more programming knowledge than a story-driven game might do. Games with enemies will require artificial intelligence, while games with rich stories will probably involve interesting characters, narrative and dialogue. The point of this is to identify as best you can the biggest tasks involved in making your idea real, and then comparing your strengths and advantages against them. Such as if you're already able to do something, or if you would enjoy learning how to do it, even if you don't know right now, or if you have the resources in money or in time to push through an issue in a way that other people may not be able to. Compare each required skill against your own abilities. Score it green if you have experience in that area, orange if you have less or no experience but are willing to learn or have resources that you can leverage, or red if you have no ability to meet a requirement at all. If you have multiple ideas, following this process for each of them can help you to decide which one would be easier for you to tackle. Or if you have just one single project in mind, 
it can help you to get an idea of the task ahead of you, particularly its biggest obstacles, such as those that scored red. But a red score doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't pursue a particular idea. It simply means that of all the obstacles in your way, this one may be particularly difficult for you. It's a weakness, sure, but depending on how important it is to the project, it's possible to limit your weaknesses or remove them altogether. For example, if you can't create 3D models and you don't want to learn how to, don't. Pick an idea where it's not important or replace it with something that's easier. You'd be surprised how much you can remove from a game without changing fundamentally what it is, which is something you'll be doing a lot of in the next step when you define the project's scope. In order to make something, you'll need to have some idea of what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. This is the scope of your project, and it's useful for understanding exactly what you're working towards. It's a clear definition of what you will and will not do, which, as it turns out, can be a lot less than you might think. This is because the smallest step between deciding on an idea and starting to make it is to create a minimum viable product. So what does that mean? There are two key characteristics of a minimum viable product. It's the most basic version of your game that can exist, but that still fulfills the idea's core concept. And it's shippable, meaning that you can actually finish it. The core concept of the game is a single statement that describes what the player will do to play it. For example, the most basic version of a platform game is a character that can move and jump, as well as some kind of obstacle that makes the moving and the jumping necessary. Probably platforms. That's all. No sounds, no real graphics, no complex progression system. If the core element of your game idea is that it's a platformer, then it's possible to take everything else away without affecting what the game actually is. But take away the moving and the jumping, and it's not a platformer anymore. This step isn't easy. Chances are, you'll have already imagined a bunch of different features that you'd like to include in your game. And I've just suggested ignoring almost all of them. But if you can identify what's important to your idea, and ruthlessly cut out everything else, if only for now, you stand a much better chance of building something that is engaging and fun. And if it's not, you'll find out a lot sooner. Which brings me to the second characteristic of a minimum viable product. Shippable. Shippable, in this context, means that the project is self-contained. So for example, you could export it, give it to a friend, and they could play it. That doesn't necessarily mean that the project is finished, far from it. It might only have one level, no audio, and be horribly ugly, but they could play it. In this sense, your minimum viable product is not the only thing that you should make, instead it's the first thing that you should make. Because if you can't make a playable version of your idea, without leaning on art styles, audio, or features that you're looking forward to working on, but that aren't entirely necessary to what your game is, then it's a sign that your idea doesn't focus enough on what the player will actually do when they play your game. In which case, consider going back a step and revisiting your idea. It's at this point that a design document, even a very simple one, in the form of a drawing of what you imagine your game to be like, can help you to identify very quickly what its main focus will be. At the very least, it will accelerate the process of refining your idea, since a sketch of your game is the next best thing to having a playable prototype, but it's much easier and much quicker to make. So, assuming that you've been able to pin down the core concept of your game, next, it's time to actually make it. The good news is that if you thought the technical hurdles of building a game, such as learning how to code, learning how to use a game engine, or how to create your game's content was the hard part, then it's not. Kind of. The bad news is that while all of that can be difficult to do, the hard part isn't necessarily knowing how to solve problems, it's knowing what problems you have. This is because if you know what it is you need to do, then finding out how can be a relatively simple process. But if you're a new developer, then it can be difficult to know what to work on first, since everything in your game is likely to be connected in some way anyway. In order to work out what to work on, and of that, what to work on first, you'll need to go back to your core concept. Think of the basic features that must exist to enable your core concept to work. 
These are high level systems and there should be nothing between them and the core concept. So for example, if the aim of your game is to collect points, a requirement of that objective might be a UI element that displays the score. But there's no reason for this to exist without the ability to score points in the first place, which is the high level system. This might seem like an oversimplification, but the point of this is to identify what comes first and what comes second. After which you can keep splitting up your general system into specific tasks. This works by breaking up each large task into only slightly smaller parts. The trick is to avoid going too small too early, since each system should be fully represented by the smaller components beneath it. You can then keep doing this until you reach individual tasks, specific problems that are easier to solve. While this isn't a perfect system, if you're struggling to find a way to turn a broad, vague objective into a to-do list that you can actually work on, then this is one way to do it, and at the very least it will highlight what the component parts of your game are so that you can open up a game engine and actually get started on making them. Speaking of game engines, you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned them yet, which might seem strange in a video about starting to make a game. Surely that's the first step, the first question to answer, what will I make my game in? So here are the top three game engines for you to choose from. Number one, the engine you already know how to use. Number two, the engine you want to know how to use. Number three, the engine that other people can show you how to use. That's it, choose any one of those and you'll be fine. Seriously though, while there are differences between game engines that might cause you to choose one over the other, it is absolutely possible to over-optimize this decision since there are very few things that only one game engine can do. Personally, I like Unity because it's fully featured, widely used, and for most people is completely free. You'll find a link to my online course, How to Code in Unity, which teaches C-sharp scripting basics in the same style as my YouTube videos in the video description. But my favorite thing about Unity is that I already know how to use it. So if your goal is to make a game, then the engine you already know is best, followed by the one you want to learn, or that you'll find the easiest to learn. It literally can be as simple as that. Once you know what you will do and how, the last step is to actually start doing it, and more importantly, keep doing it until it's done. There are many ways to manage a project, and you'll probably have some idea of how you like to do it. However, one method is to manage each task as if you're giving it to someone else. This can be a useful tactic since, even as a team of one, you are the owner, manager and the developer of your game project. And while being all of those things at once can be useful, sometimes the easiest way to work is with a single focus on one task that someone else gave you. Which is why it can be useful to separate the task of managing your project from actually working on it. At its most basic level, this involves writing down all the tasks that you need done. But if you want to be a good manager, to yourself, take the time to write a clear brief for each task. One method of making sure that your task is well defined is with the SMART mnemonic, where a brief should be specific, meaning that what you're supposed to do is clearly described, measurable, which is how you'll know the task has actually been finished, achievable, meaning that you are able to do the task that you've been given, relevant, which is the context of the task and how it fits into the rest of your project, and time-bound, which is the task's deadline, or realistically for you, it might be the priority of the task over other things that you need to do. This may seem like overkill, and depending on how you like to work, it might be. But what's important is to pay attention to how well you're managing your most valuable resource, your time. After all, it's easy to be inefficient at either end of the scale, where failing to plan any of your time may mean that you end up wasting it, or that it takes longer to make any progress in your game. While at the other extreme, it's possible to spend all of your time managing what you're supposed to be doing, and not enough time actually doing any of it. James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, describes this as motion versus action, where motion is planning and preparation, and action is the behaviour that actually leads to results. I started this video by telling you that just start can be unhelpful advice if you don't know where to begin. Which is true, and hopefully by now you'll have a good idea of some practical steps that you can take to plan your first project. However, don't confuse motion with action. 
once you have an idea of what you want to do, and once you've worked out some of the first steps you can take to make it happen, you really do need to just start. Now I want to hear from you. How are you managing your game project? Are you planning your tasks in advance or working through problems as they turn up? And what have you learned about working on a game for the first time that you know someone else would find useful? Whatever it is, let me know by leaving a comment, like this video if it helped you, and get subscribed for more from me. I'll see you next time.